Hey everybody, if you haven't found the perfect holiday gift for the Broadway lover in your life, don't forget to check out Be a Broadway Star on Amazon.com. Read those reviews. You'll pick up one for your friend and probably for yourself as well. Be a Broadway Star.com. Now on with the podcast. I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be a producer. Hello, everybody. Ken Davenport here. This is the Producer's Perspective Podcast, the National Touring Edition, because once again, we've taken this podcast on the road. I'm speaking to you from the back lot of Universal Studios in Los Angeles, where I'm not allowed to take any photos because we're on the on the set of Hairspray Live. And I'm in the office of today's guest. Please welcome to the podcast the Tony Award-winning director, Mr. Kenny Leon. Welcome, Kenny. Hey, it's good to be here. So Kenny won his Tony for the revival of Raisin in the Sun, which also won the Tony that year for Best Revival, starring Denzel Washington. On Broadway, also directed Stick Fly, The Mountaintop, The Tupac Musical, Holler If You Hear Me, Fences, Radio Golf, and many, many others. He directed The Wiz Live on NBC, and like I just said, he's in the middle of rehearsals for Hairspray Live coming up, and was the artistic director of Atlanta's Alliance Theater. Kenny, where did you get bit by the theater bug? Well, first of all, I should say that now I'm an artistic director of True Colors Theater Company, which is a theater of diversity, and I'm very proud of the work we do there as a small theater in Atlanta. But I think that I got bit probably in church, you know, listening to stories in church. And I remember uh, when I was really young, we were in a program called Upward Bound in St. Petersburg, Florida, me and Angela Bassett. And uh, it was a program for low-income families who had college potential. So from ninth grade on, I was taking classes in theater and math, science. Every every weekend and every summer, I had to spend on a college campus from ninth grade on. And so I remember Angela Bassett and I ended up doing plays. We did a play called Sun Gone Home, and she played my mother, even though I was older. So, you know, I've always, you know, had it in church, had it in, um, you know, an elbow bound program. When I got to college, I met people like uh, Samuel L. Jackson and his wife, Latanya, and Spike Lee and I were in the same class. So during that time, it was sort of like a mini hall of renaissance in Atlanta, you know, in the Atlanta University Center, you know, where the college performances were the professional black theater in Atlanta. So, you know, it was an opportunity to learn theater, to get involved in it. But at that time, I was a political science major. So I was a political science major and a theater minor. And actually went through a little bit of law school for like half a year. But, you know, I looked a certain way at a certain time. So I was doing television commercials and started acting. I left law school and, you know, started on that acting journey. And then one day I directed a play called The Wishing Place. And I was like, whoa. That's what I want to do. I want to direct. You know, I was a pretty good actor and still try to act every two years or so so I can, you know, be able to challenge people like Denzel or Sam Jackson or Audrey McDonald in a room and say, I know what you're feeling because I've been through that process. But I just get so much more out of uh, directing. You know, you have a chance to help people become bigger, to step into bigger shoes. And I love being a part of that process with the actors and with the designers. When So you were in this Upper Bound program, and were the people around you going like, oh, he's going to be a doctor, he's going to be a lawyer, he's going to be a physicist? And oh, yeah, you're yeah, like, no, 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 I'm going to the theater. No, I didn't know I was going to be going to the theater. When I'm Upper Bound, I was like, oh, I'm going to be I'm going to be a congressman. I actually was a, an intern. We could use you about right now, oh, by the oh, way. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, you, you, you can use me now, but it's gonna, the answer is going to come from an artistic world. So, you know, hairspray is the beginning of my revolution. It's a demonstration of what the world should look like, what our country should feel like. So that's the beginning of the revolution. <laughs> I love it. I love it. In a sentence, describe a, what a director's job is to you. What's what's your job? If you had to write a job description in the classified. Oh, that's crazy, man. And, and it's different for every project. But for me, a director is it's a therapist, a psychologist, a teacher, explorer, a doctor, and father figure. So it's all of that into one and for something as massive as Hashtag Live, you really, you know, you have to get all of those actors and there's over 50 actors, not counting the extras. And you're trying to get them all to go in one direction, trying to have them have the, all of the same tone. And for this, it's not, you know, it's not a play, it's not a film, it's not television. It's a little bit of all of that. So you have to find the right speaking voice for this. So I get everybody on the same page. I have to make sure I get rid of all the warts early on. That's the main job of a director, to disguise 
the warts, you know. So if you can't change them or get the actor to get rid of the warts, then you have to hide them by the way you move people, the way you change the rhythm of lines or something like that. Ultimately, I'm, I'm the chief collaborator. And you just jumped into directing when you directed that first play. Where did you learn to be all of these things? Were you trained? Did you have a mentor? What was that? You know, I mean, when I was in, I was at the Academy of Music and Theater in Atlanta. I remember this company and where some actors, uh, most of us acted, but then some of us were given an opportunity to direct. And the artistic director, Frank Witt Wittow, at that time, he was a great friend who passed away a couple of years ago. After my first foray into directing, he said, well, Ken, I just don't think you have the skills for directing. I think you should just, we would love to have you back as an actor. We love what you do. And I said, it's time to leave. And I didn't know what I was going to do next, but it was time to leave because I felt I did have the skills to direct. And so I, I ended up being right on that one. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, but then I was also... Soon thereafter, I applied for a program because during the time at the Academy Theater, I, I did things like uh, I learned how to teach workshop in prison. So I went into the prison system and worked with the prisoners and taught them acting, acting skills. I worked with the homeless population, did something called People of the Brick and, and taught homeless people how to act. And then I applied for this program, this uh, fellowship for directors through the NEA and Theater Communications Group. And I got that. And what made me stand out was the fact that I had worked with these different groups as a director, in addition to acting in Hamlet or directing Death of a Salesman or you know, things like that. So that's sort of, so when I spent that year and as a director of fellowship, it was one of the best things to happen for me because it allowed me to observe Prince Thomas Stan Wojnarowski at Center Stage. That's, that's the year I met August Wilson. That's the year I talked with Lord Richards. And got really immersed in this whole idea of the regional theater movement. Then once I was offered the associate artistic director's job at the Alliance Theater, and then a year later being named artistic director, as a part of that gig, it was important for me to at least spend one one slot a year I would direct at some theater in the country in addition to running the Alliance Theater. So I would go to Milwaukee Repertory Theater, uh, uh, Arena Stage, San Jose Rep, Mark Taper Forum, Hartford Stage. So all those years, in my early years, I was still learning about directing and, and how to be an, administ an administrator as well. And then after about 11 years of running the theater, 13 years total, I decided that I was spending too much time on the administration side. You know, I was raising a lot of money, but was losing myself as an artist. And then... I decided to leave, and then that same year I was offered two Broadway shows, which I never could have done if I was still running the theater. So, you know, that's a short short story of it. A lot of uh, Broadway's best directors, a lot of you A-listers, came from being the artistic director of major nonprofits. We had Jack O'Brien on a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. and Ted McEnough. Why do you think being an artistic director trains you so well to be a successful Broadway director? I think uh, the regional theater... And serving as artistic director trains you for Broadway because you see the entire picture. You understand the mind of producers. You understand where the money goes. You understand how to balance the budget. You understand how important the art is. So you get to see everything. You get to work with every department. You get to work with, you know, you're responsible for the costume department and the production department and the technical director. And you work with the development director. And you work with a board of directors. So you sort of, it's like a... It's like running a, a regional theater, it's like running a small Broadway show. So, you know, you can compare to both. So it's like, I understand Broadway better because of my time, you know, running a, you know, $15 million a year regional theater. You worked with a lot of incredible people on your way up. Any advice you got from people back then that you still think about today? Well, absolutely. But, you know, the, the, the great thing also about regional theater, you get to, because you were hiring a lot of directors. So you get to know the other directors in the field and you get to see a lot of sensibilities and, and the different ways to attack material because, you know, you don't have to just look at what you do. You look at a wide variety of what people do. So on the way up, I met a lot of people. I met, uh, you know, people like Irene Lewis, who was, who was at Center Stage working a lot when I was there. And she was like, Kenny Leon, you're going to end up hiring all of us. And I was like, what? <laughs> so it was great. And Lloyd Richards, who was always, you know, always questioning 
make sure you know why you're doing it. You know? Why are you doing it? And I remember you giving the advice to the board of directors who hired me. They said, it's great because he's hot and he's young now, but are you going to be there when the subscription goes down or when it's a challenging play that you don't want to produce? Or, you know, and by him saying that to them at that point, when my subscription base did go down, my board of directors was prepared because they had that talk with Lord, you know. Um, and then I remember, like August Wilson said, you know, just because she said, well, I see you're doing more television and more film, and I know you'll never leave the theater because that's that's the meat. But he said, just remember when you're in the television world, remember that, you know, we're the filler. And I said, what? We're the filler. We always thought of commercials as being the filler, but you have to be able to tell your story within their meat is the commercials. So you have to make sure the story works after the commercials. So I always remember that. So I was like, okay. So even when as I'm doing hairspray live, he's like, okay, we want that first that first commercial. We got to have that as late as possible because we have to hook them. We have to engage them in the story so they want to back and and see what we want to give them. So yeah, little stuff like that. If you could only direct one type of show for the rest of your life, what would it be? New play, revival of a play, new musical, revival of a musical. You can only do one. Your agent says to you, Kenny, this is it for the rest of your career. Which one would you want to do? A new musical. Why? Because I would have a chance of creating something that the world's not experienced, and that's always great going through that. And there is a wider audience for the new musical than they are for the new play. Even though I love new plays, but I had to pick one and go for the new musical, the, the new cutting edge, different musical. The hottest recruiting of the world, you know, the Hamilton of the world, or the, you know. Yeah, and that's all that comes around once in a lifetime. But you know what I mean? Like, so you can explore it, a story in a variety of ways. You know, sometimes it's best told through dance. Sometimes dance is through song. Sometimes it's through spoken word. So you get a chance to put all of them together and decide how to give it out. You know, it's not, it's not all dependent on the spoken word. On a new project, on a new play or a new musical, how early do you like to get involved? Do you like to get involved when there's not much of a script and really get in there, or do you like to wait until the thing is done and baked? I like to get in from the very beginning so I can collaborate with the artist early on and, and massage it and put that foundation in before it gets too far down the road. And you're obviously you're doing Hairspray Live now. What do you think about this whole live movement? This is your second one, right? Yes. You did The Wiz, mm -hmm. uh, which was fantastic, and everyone's looking forward to Hairspray. Uh, what do you think about this whole live Broadway I, getting on television like this? I think this live musical event thing is a great revolution to be a part of. I think Bob Greenblatt had a great idea when he started doing these, and Craig Zayden and uh, Neil Marin to shepherd, you know, sound and music, then Peter Pan, then me with The Wiz, and... I like the idea that Fox got into the game with Grease and, and then now we're doing uh, Hairspray. I think it's only going to help. Number one, is going to help. It's going to give job opportunities to theater artists, you know, television artists, and young people who haven't ever had a job. You know, Matt, Maddie Dalio is her first big time job. Shanice Williams with The Wiz is her first job and her first entrance into the profession that, you know, that she wants to spend her life in, you know, and it, it also gives an opportunity for people who don't usually get a chance to work together to work together, you know, so you have Ariana Grande working with Kristen Chenoweth, you know, that's beautiful, you know, so then their audience sees that Ariana Grande is more than just a pop culture singing icon, you know, or people know that Harvey is not just the theater person, you know, so I love all these artists coming together an opportunity to grow their talent. I like the idea that the audience, they see this one-time event and they're like, wow, they want to go see a play in the community, not just Broadway, and they want to tune in for the next one, you know. I like the fact that it's cross-generational, you know, because it's all about numbers, getting people to watch it. So in our production of Hairspray, we have someone for every decade, you know. We have a 10-year-old, a 20-year-old, a 30-year-old, 40-year-old, 50-year-old, 60-year-old, 70-year-old, and they all have followers on social media, you know, but they're all the talented, you know, so it gets the, all of them get a chance to merge their audiences and the broaden the minds of their audiences, you know. It's like, oh, you thought you liked Ariana Grande, but she's working with Kenny Leon, so, wow, what's that guy, Nick? You know, his, he's doing opera next, or maybe I'll go and see an opera, you know, so it's like, it's, I think it's good, good for everyone. 
Was it scary, the Night of the Wiz? I mean, you're such a cool, easygoing guy. It's scary guy. now. <laughs> yes, it was scary. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like I tell the group now, I say, we can, you know, I've been through this. So I'm, t- I'm going to tell you what you're getting ready to experience now. You know, like, you know, there's no flaps now. It's like the days are not stopping. It's like Monday to Friday feels like Monday. It feels like one day. And that's just the way it it goes. But I'm still nervous because there's so many things that could go wrong, especially with us doing 40, 40% more of this story outside. So we're going, we're going from location to location to location. We have to move the talent either running or on golf carts and then they have to change clothes. So, you know, change makeup. So to me, it reminds me it's a little bit of television, a little bit of film, a little bit of, a little bit of theater, a little bit of song, but it's also a little bit of the Super Bowl. So we have to keep everyone in shape, you know, we have to like, okay, so we, we practice, we run our plays, you know, we will have practice as much as we could up until the event, but we have no control over the wind, we have no control over the rain, we have no control over how cold it's going to be or how warm it's going to be, we're going to prepare for that. And that's the exciting part of it, and you hope you still, hope you win the game, you hope a lot of people come to the game. So it's, it's exciting like that. It's a tremendous high. And then on the day after, you said, wow, hopefully we would, would have reached, let's say, 25 million viewers, you know, and they got a chance to see how we want America to be inclusive for everyone, size, race, sexual identity, all of that. And uh, if we win that, that's a pretty good contribution to the discussion in America right now. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that and about true colors. Diversity, obviously, is a big thing on Broadway. And Broadway, if you read over the last season, everyone was championing how well we did in terms of diversity. How do you think we're doing in terms of diversity on Broadway right now? <laughs> well, I had a couple of interviews last year, and they, they said, what do you think? And last year, I said, well, we just have to wait a year to see if it's, you know, if it's true diversity or it's just um, happenstance. And um, I think it's happenstance, you know, it's like, you know, still what drives Broadway is like you still have to get good product that people, that producers think people would want to go see. There is some interest in diversity, but that's not a top three driver of, you know, and you can probably see, you know, there are 41 theaters. So it's like, okay, who's going to fill those 41 theaters? I still don't have a home for the Wiz. We need to get a home for that. You know, so I would love the day when I feel that our Broadway community, all of us, where we felt that diversity was a number one or two driving force for the shows that we did. And I think that if we did that and had a commitment to really diversify our audience, you would see the stories change, you would see the audience build. And uh, there's not just, there's more than one way to make money, you know. So what is something that the individuals out there listening right now, all the all the people that are all over the world listening to this, that they can do to help this. Is there is there anything that we can do just as individuals to help try to diversify the theater even more? Well, I think that you know people can write to their local papers and write to the New York Times and write to wherever you can to say what you want to see on the stage. You know, I think that um, also going to support those things that are on Broadway. That, that you think are interesting to you and exciting, not just because it's a fun musical, because that story might be interesting. I think it's good to take someone else to a Broadway show that normally wouldn't go see the show that you would go see, you know. So the few things that are of diverse interest, go see those, support those, write a letter at the theater, leave the letter there with the theater. So I think those are some of the things you should. What does it take to get you to sign on to a project? Like, what what interests you? What what makes you go? Oh, I, this one I'm going to do. I read. I first get a play. I read it five times, and if I like want to pick it up the sixth time, then that's good. Really, five times? Yeah, I read it five th- times without thinking about it. So I'm trying to not think about it. I'm trying to read it, 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 read it. If I want to read it the sixth time, then, it's like, oh. then I go back and look for the characters. And, you know, but usually. After that second or third time, you really know if you want to do it. So it's the content, the potential for changing lives, inspiring people, the timeliness of it. Even when I look at a revival, I'm saying, okay, what does that say to an audience today? It's like when I did A Race in the Sun the second time on Broadway. It was nothing at all like the first time. And I never thought about the first time when I was working on it the second time. But I felt like the country 
needed that particular play and I wanted it to I wanted a big play to feel intimate. So I moved it closer to the audience and I had them feel included in that. So I wanted to put black and white together. So in subtle ways I, I did that. So I'm always thinking about okay, what's what's a time to play? What's do I feel like I have to do this? Do I feel urgently possessed to present this? And would it, you know, would it be exciting for me to be involved in it for the next six years, a year, two years of your life? Because what you don't want to do, you don't want to say yes to something and then something better comes along and you say, oh, I got to leave that project to go to this project. You know, you don't want to do that. So when I say yes to something, it's really like, I really want to do this. I really want to do this because I love what it's saying. I love the potential that it could uh, affect people's lives. I, I, I see a few great roles for some actors that may want to be involved with this, you know. So, you know, like, you know, I've been working on for a couple of years. I've been attached to Children of a Lesser God. And we're going to have a workshop finally in December, right after this. And I still think that's a timely thing. The thing with that, you have to, there's a play about a hearing impaired woman and her, her ASL teacher. And people always think it's a play about, you know, the hearing impaired, and it's not. It's a love story about two people who are trying to communicate, and that's a universal thing. And I grew in the knowledge of that play last year when I thought we were going to be on board with this year with it. So I took some lessons, and I took lessons from this beautiful woman who was deaf from birth, had two kids to death, and her husband was deaf. She taught me every Tuesday in Brooklyn, like sign language. And I was like, everything I need to know about the play being with her helped me because we took lessons. I took my lessons in public places. So I met her in a bar. Then we went to a restaurant. Then we went to sit on the side of a bridge. Then we, you know, so we learned everything, you know, by needing to communicate with each other. And she wouldn't let me have any shortcuts. But the wonderful thing about her, she was one of the most beautiful women that I've ever seen. So I was like, wow, that's the story. Because she has everything. We always want to make people over. And there's no reason to make her over. Hence the title, Children of a Lesser God. We want to make people over in our image. And I kept saying this time and time again. We'll go to, say, a front desk of a museum and they would look at her eyes. You know, a guy would look at her and then when he found out that she was deaf, then he would slowly turn to me. You know, I was like, oh. Or it's like in the play, there's a scene in the play where he's trying to convince her, the hearing guy is trying to convince the hearing impaired person to have sex the way he See, sex, you have to make a sound. You have to, and I was like, you may not need to make a sound. Maybe her way is better. Maybe her way is more intimate, you know. And so I learned a lot through that. So I'm very excited. And I've um, convinced the uh, producer, Hal Lufthard, who did Kinky Boots. He, uh, the woman who taught me the ASL, I got her doing the reading, doing the role in the reading. So it's an African-American woman, multiracial. And then I got Joshua Jackson. It was just going to come in and read. So I got a, 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 a TV star that I worked with before. So they're going to, we're going to do a workshop. I don't know what happened after this, but, you know, that, you know, get a sexy white actor and a sexy, uh, hearing impaired African American woman, you know, kind of opens it up in a different way. So, so, you know, it's a lot of stuff, you know, looking at that and the revival of proof we're supposed to bring back. And Denzel and I was talking about, you know, we try to go back every three to four years. So, Looks like we're going to try to do something in um, 18 or 19, probably 19. But, you know, so you just try to keep eight balls in there and hope you can grab two. And I'm going to direct a reboot of, of uh, Car Wash the Musical. So they ordered a 30 minute pilot for ABC. So we do that. And another big TV project that we haven't announced yet. So you just try to keep working as the artist, keep trying to grow. I want to do like. All of it because it makes me better. So I want to do opera. I want to do musicals. I want to do drama. I want to do Broadway. And then in, in Atlanta, True Colors, we're going to do, we're going to revisit Holly B. Hidden, the Tupac musical. And I'm going to go and do it with the, um, the colleges in Atlanta. So I'm going to get a um, small group of students. So I'm doing master class with all year. And then I'm going to put them in the play. And then we're going to open up one or two parts numbers where he talked about the future of young people, and I'm going to hear their voices. So I'm going to let the Black Lives Matter and those voices get built into the show in a way that marries it to Tupac's musical. So I get to 
But when that next summer, which could be very, very exciting. You work with students, and then you work with Denzel. Yeah. So do you find you have to adjust your style when you work with big stars or unknown no. actors? Is well, it, yeah, it's funny because with, even with the Hollywood Hemi, that'll be a professional play for my company. So I have most of the cast will be professional actors, and then this little pocket of 10 people will be students. So that's going to be great. It's no different than working with, I mean, you're different. Sometimes you, there's more teaching involved than not. But like I, like I said earlier, you know, you're a psychologist too. So in the first seven days of anything I'm working on, I'm trying to figure out how, how the actors process information individually. So if there are 50 people involved in that first week, I'm trying to, my way, I'm figuring out, oh, I, that person, I got to screen that. Oh, that person's going to be trouble. That person got to take a dinner. That person I got to teach. That person needs a line reading. Oh, that person is an asshole. Oh, uh, okay. In three days of this person, that's right. I have to fire that person, replace that person with that person. You know what I mean? So it's always trying to figure out who you have on the team and how they process information. And sometimes there's more teaching involved. Sometimes there's more. I think sometimes the best gift that I can get for actors is to get out the way. I know when to get out the way. So when working with someone like Denzel Washington or Viola Davis, you know when to get out the way. And you try to figure out if they get stuck, can you help get them unstuck? And the big job is to draw the big picture so everybody knows what parameter we're playing. This is the ball what we're playing. That doesn't belong to it. This is what, you know, so you got to shape that and articulate that. And then be a partner to them and guarantee them that you're not going to let them be exposed. Do you read reviews? Once in a while, but I never read reviews until after, like, long after the work is done. I used to then read them at all, but now I'm, I'm able to read them because... You know, there are only like a few people that I kind of respect. So it's like you sort of know where to put it, you know what I mean? It's, you know, and... Uh, Who do you respect? Uh, John La, Frank Rich, you know. Because what I always say is, can a person, can they ascertain what you were trying to do as a director? And if you were like, successful in accomplishing it, that's all I want you to write about. But if you're writing about like, oh, I saw this in 1959, and it's not like that, and that's not helping... Helping the theater feel, you know, it's supposed to utterly encourage people to go to the theater and make up their own mind. It's not supposed to be, oh, and there's a man standing in the chair clapping, so I got ten claps in the chair, so I'm good. Or the man sitting down sleeping, you know, I don't. So, so you know, so sometimes I look forward not to see how the player's doing, but I might read. I, I, I want to read what someone intellectually, academically feel about the work. You know what I mean? But you know, it's like the cast for this. I said, look. I really don't care too much what what the press says on December eighth, but I want to be able to look at the other artists and say, "Do you have any regrets? Did you do what you set out to do? If you didn't give me a hundred percent, then you know you got some regrets." So that's what I worry about, and I do. But I am sensitive to my greatest nightmare, especially for Broadway or doing a live production, is if people leave the theater. I'm not one of those. Artists. I don't like if. You know, the droves of people left the theater at intermission. I, I'm not that guy. I'm always doing it for like the audience. I want them to find their place in the story. So I'm sensitive like that, which is why the one thing I could never give up probably is theater because I can stand in the back on opening night or the day after opening night. I don't, I don't usually stay for opening, but on uh, the day after opening or doing previews and just feel the collective audience. And to see when they lean in, and to see when they're laughing, or to see when they're crying. It's, you can't get that anywhere else. You know? Favorite production you've done? Mm, favorite production. You know, it's like I always say, you know, the, the, the last one that you did probably is the favorite one. But, you know, uh, for a lot of reasons, I like that production of Princess. And then when I, when I saw the film last week, I was really proud of the work that, you know, that group of people did on Broadway and that they're doing now. So I'm real proud of that. I'm real proud of both productions of the Raising in the Sun for different reasons, you know. It's, to see Sean Combs who had never acted and to be a part of that, and Arthur McDonald and Felicia Rashad to win with Tony and that category, which had never been done, and then to work with Denzel on this Raising and to, to see it that group of people and Tony Richardson and all them did. I'm real proud of that. And so it's like, I think I took away something from almost everything, you know. That, Denise Graves and doing the Oscar Margaret Garner. It's really sad. Holly could hear my left it because, you know, Tupac's mother was there and she says, You did my son right. 
and I'll never forget that. You know, she passed away this year. So, you know, you have a lot to do. I have a lot to do. Thankful for it. Thankful for it. And I just, you know, woke up look, looking forward to the next show. Like, this hairspray is like, I do feel that people think it's just a feel good news, but I feel like it's, uh, it's a moment in time. I feel it's important, and I feel like God gave us the right group of people to work with it at this specific time to deliver this. I mean, Jerry Mitchell doing the choreography and he and I working together, that's not, that's unheard of to get, you know, those two people on a project. And Harvard Firestein, we worked together on The Wiz, now you write this, now you stars in this, and I couldn't think of anybody that I would want to play the lead in this. I just can't, you know, when they say that, I said, I gotta have Harvey, you know what I mean? I just, it, and, and Everett and Kristen Chenoweth, we've known each other, but never worked together, and she's like, oh, I feel like I've known you for 30 years, and, you know, so it's like, it feels really special, and all the young people, they really want it, they, they, they're hungry for it, and they're listening to advice, and so I feel a different role, I feel more important, role. I gotta, like, be more of a teacher for this, and that's how you can serve winning a Tony Award, because then you can say, okay, I won that, but this is what comes with it, so I can tell them what it means to me, how you go about the work, what to expect in the next 10 years, whatever. So it's a, it's a real special, it's a real special group. Alice Rosinski is just a great, great camera director. Just, so we have every, every possible area covered at the highest level, and you don't get that always. So it's like, wow, wow. The only thing that can mess this up is me. Advice to people out there that want to be directors? The most powerful thing in the pursuit of directing, I think, is observing. Some people don't see the power in that. They just want to direct so quick. And I think that get around someone who is directing, sit in their space, and be quiet. Any different advice for people of color out there who want to be directors? That most of the time is going to seem like it's impossible. So you really have to have a, a strong spiritual center. And if you wake up knowing that you got to do it, then trust that. Yeah, I love that story of someone telling you, you're not going to be a director and you're, right. and you're leaving. What a pivotal moment in your life. Jeez. Okay, last question. My James Lipton question, okay? I want you to imagine that the genie from Aladdin comes to visit you and knocks on your door and says, Kenny, I want to thank you for all the amazing work you've done on Broadway to advance diversity, working with young people, everything. I want to thank you for all of it by granting you one wish. What's the one thing that drives you so crazy about Broadway that gets you steaming mad, swearing, throwing things that you would ask this genie to take away with that one so wish? Fun. You know, I guess was, uh, I'm going to get that award that Jerry got a couple years ago, the Mr. Abbott Award. So I was like, been thinking a lot about that. But to answer the question more specifically, it would be what pisses me off. I've been doing this um, TDF program for every year. It's like a, a, a group of inner city kids, eight to ten inner city kids in New York, to for all those shows. Then I took them to a restaurant, change restaurants, because a lot of them have been in restaurants. Go to a restaurant, and we talk about the themes of the play. And that's my group all year. And then, you know, I found out that many of them, you know, in the beginning of the year, I'm like, yeah, you got to go to college, you got to get in. And I'm realizing that college is not even possible for most of these kids. And it's not their fault. And I didn't, I didn't know that until recently. You know what I mean? I, I kind of knew, I didn't know it. So I'm like, yeah, you just work for now. No, no, it's not just that. It's like the neighborhoods you're born in, the schools that are not there for you. And you get, you can't even compete. So when I see these kids I've been working with, and I see them the following year, and I say, what are you doing? Oh, I'm working at the nail shop. I'm working at this center, but you're so smart. Or I meet some of those same kids who are, um, they're challenged and, and, you know, maybe some version of autism or different ways. And, and we haven't worked with them enough to, to give them an educational life that would be meaningful enough to them, you know. It's just, and then when you try to, even when you try to take these kids in that program to see Broadway shows, sometimes you can't get, I can't give them the experience of sitting in the orchestra. It's like, oh, well, we got four seats left, and they're on the last row, and it's like, that's not even the right experience. I mean, for us as producers and artists and directors, I ought to be able to say, hey, I'm Kenny Leon, I just directed on Broadway, we're gonna sit these kids right here, and then that's our future audience, and they'll get it, and you know, but 
So if if I could do that, that's what I would make in a small way. You know, I know we, I know it's a money making endeavor, but I would say for every show with these kids, and especially in in New York and other cities, that we could get every performance with this. You know, you know, make it possible for them to sit to center orchestra. You know, those kids. Well, when I'm producing my my next show, you let me know. We'll put them we'll put them down center for sure. Um, Thank you uh, so much for doing this and taking your time out of your busy schedule. Everyone out there, watch Hairspray Live December seventh. It's coming up just a couple weeks away. Very exciting. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you all next time. Don't forget the number one ranked Broadway gift on Amazon.com is Be a Broadway Star, the only Broadway board game out there. Go get one for the Broadway lover in your life today.